Um, so this for me is a sort of new topic, and I thought it would be fun to try this out um, and have it videotaped and shared online uh, for the world to see. Um, so the topic is, you know, sort of initially at least, it's about a practical question. It's about what we should do in cases like the case on the handout. So there's a very simple example that we'll start with, and this is basically going to serve as the basis for the rest of the discussion. But you can imagine a situation in which there are 100 prisoners exercising in a prison yard, and then suddenly 99 of them join in an attack. And the 100th prisoner had no knowledge ahead of time of the attack and no knowledge of the attack. I mean, if it helps you, you can imagine this person had no knowledge while it was occurring either. So just they knew nothing. Um, and, and that's basically all you're going to know. There's, there's a group of 100 prisoners, and 99 of the 100 joined in a planned assault on the guard. And then there's this question about what we can do in the wake of this, if this is all we're ever going to sort of know about the situation. You'll get no. You'll get no new information. That is all the information you're going to get. And so the, the proposition I want to consider on the handout, punish, says that under conditions like this, where you have the kind of evidence that you do, it would be acceptable to punish a prisoner taken at random out of this group. Okay. Um, now, I was surprised when I gave sort of an initial version of this talk to our undergrads and some of our grad students at a, at a reading party. I sort of thought the whole room was going to say, oh, punish is outrageous. And what I found was that a lot of people were quite confident in their intuitions, but the intuitions divided pretty evenly within the room, which I found kind of shocking. Actually, I found it kind of sobering, because we had just finished drinks, and I thought, oh my god, only half of this room is going to be friendly. So very quickly, I started to think I'd better come up with some very good arguments to try to bring the other side around to this view. So I don't know where people are starting with this. I'll just lay it on the table that I think that there's something wrong with punishing under these conditions. But I understand that these kinds of intuitions can be unreliable. So I'm open to the idea that a very good argument might sway me. But what I'm going to try to do is present an argument for punish. This argument came to me the first time through some work by Katie Steele, who was of LSE. And I heard her give a presentation on this topic uh, last summer. Um, and so the argument I'm going to give is pretty similar to the argument that she gave on the occasion for punish. But there's other versions of this argument in the literature as well. So there's a 1977 paper by someone named Lempert who runs the same kind of argument. And the argument just says something like this. Think about the way your system of punishment should work, right? So you've got options like either to punish uh, the defendant or not punish the defendant. And then we hope that we will assign different values to punishing and not punishing on the basis of what the defendant is like. So if the defendant wasn't involved, we should think that the punishment is unfortunate and perhaps if the defendant was involved, we might think of the punishment as fortunate. So I'm just going to assume that if we drew up a decision matrix like the one on the, on the grid, the, the cell that corresponds to punishing someone who's guilty gets a positive value, and the cell that corresponds to punishing someone who's innocent gets a negative value. And in terms of their magnitudes, I'm hoping that you agree with me that the magnitude of disvalue associated with punishing the innocent exceeds the amount of value that comes with punishing the guilty. But that is not universally held. That is just something that I assume that everyone in this room will agree with. Um, and I'll take that as a starting point. Now, if that's our starting point, and I'm trying not to trip on this cable, um, I'm just going to throw some random numbers in here. I'm going to assume things like, um, you know, uh, punishing the guilty is kind of like a plus one, and punishing the innocent is kind of like a negative 10. And if you like, this one's kind of optional, but I'm going to assume that failing to punish someone who's guilty uh, is a kind of missed opportunity. It's unfortunate. You might think, you know, there's sort of this this imbalance in karmic justice that needs to be righted, so we'll regard that as an unfortunate thing. But let's just assume that failing to punish the innocent is neither good nor bad. It is just, an, you know, it is nothing from the point of view of the law. Okay. Um, now, a couple of things about punishment that I'll also assume, you know, I have lots of friends who, and, and we disagree about these kinds of things, so some of them like to say, well, punishment's really only justified on forward-looking grounds. Now, I mean, in a way, I can kind of agree with that. I agree that when you're trying to justify things like the intentional infliction of harm or suffering upon someone, um, yeah, then you should think about whether it does have any sort of um, forward-looking considerations that support it. But I think it's crucially important that we don't think that the system could be, as it were, uh, purely forward-looking. So I, I hope that no one in the room thinks that it would be appropriate to take a person who isn't guilty and to plug them into the system, as it were, because of the forward-looking considerations. So I'm hoping that at the very least we would all agree that a system of punishment, if working appropriately, would at least try to discriminate between the guilty and the not guilty, and not just think, oh, here's a nice opportunity to scare people straight. 
So at the very least, it has to have that backwards looking element where guilt plays a sort of important role in determining the justification of the distribution of punishment. And we can get into semantics disputes about punishment. So I, I mean, the way I use the word punishment, punishment always has to involve at least an intention to do something to someone who is taken to be guilty in some sense. Um, people might think, no, you could punish people knowing them to be innocent. That's a kind of semantic dispute I don't want to get into. I'm just telling you how I use um, the word punishment. But if, if you agree that we should set up the decision matrix in roughly the way that I, I have, then it looks like we have a simple, straightforward argument for punish. Um, I mean, if you set up the issue that I have, it looks like this is a case of decision under risk, right? Because, um, you know, there's some probability that the person you've selected out of the population is innocent. There's some probability that they're guilty, right? And when you're thinking about those things because of that uncertainty, it's at least a decision that involves an element of uncertainty, but we can put probabilities on it, right, because we know that there were 99 people who were involved out of the 100. So when you're doing that, right, we can now use a norm, a norm that says something like, well, what you ought to do or what rationality requires is for you to maximize expected value, and the relevant values here have to do with the administration of punishment to guilty and innocent. And the first argument, I'll call it the primary argument for punishment, says if there's one option that maximizes expected value, this is the one that rationality requires. Um, punish is the option that maximizes expected value, so that's what rationality requires of us. And I've, sort of draw, I've tried to sort of draw out the argument, maybe at an, at an absurd length, right? So the, the sort of initial conclusion is that it would be rational for people like us to punish under circumstances like this. But then a lot of people seem to think that there's an interesting link between what you should do and what rationality requires of you. So people like John Gibbons and Errol Lord defend this kind of view. Once we've established that the sort of practically rational thing to do in the circumstance is punish, it couldn't then be that the thing we ought to do is refrain. So it's supposed to follow that punishment is either permitted or required in the circumstances described. Okay, now that's the argument for punish. And I just want to sort of highlight one thing that I think makes this interesting. So one thing that makes it interesting for me is I think it's a prima facie plausible argument for an implausible conclusion because I think punish is deeply counterintuitive. But I, of course, don't like to take issue with people who say things like, in cases of decision under risk, you should maximize expected value. I also don't you know, hate the matrix that I came up with in the beginning. It looks quite plausible. So it looks like, on the one hand, there's a plausible matrix, a plausible strategy we have for dealing with cases of decision under risk, but it points to a conclusion that I find unacceptable. So one puzzle we face is trying to get all of, the, to sort of get all of these things to cohere. But there's another puzzle we face, and of course, if you know Martin's work, you know this puzzle as well. So some people in this room might think, well, you shouldn't punish in this case because you should never punish, but those are not fun people to argue with. Some of you might think, no, some conditions are such that it's appropriate to punish, but some aren't. So I take it that a line that some people take, and I think this is a line that Martin would take, and it's probably a line that someone like Gilbert Harmon would take, is look, if you, had, if you had an eyewitness who could testify that someone was or was not involved in the assault, right, well, that could be the basis for a just punishment. Right? But, uh, but the use of statistical evidence perhaps couldn't be. So some people think there's intuitive asymmetry here. So you could use eyewitness testimony for, for justified or permiss permissible punishment, but you can't use statistical evidence. Of course, part of what makes this puzzling is we know or at least have good reason to believe that that eyewitness testimony is less reliable when it comes to discriminating between the guilty and, and the innocent than the statistical evidence. Much in the way that reading something in a newspaper is, is going to be less reliable than forming a belief on the basis of statistical evidence about the outcome of a lottery. And yet, many people think that it's rational to believe things you read in newspapers, but then they're uncertain about whether you should believe lottery propositions. Okay, so that's another puzzle. It feels like puzzles are, are starting to mount up. Now, I think a lot of the literature, at least a lot of the literature that I've read, is dedicated to people trying to explain what's wrong with punish. So I'll just highlight a couple of the, the moves in the literature. I mean, I sort of, in some ways, are sympathetic with the points that some of these people are trying to make, but I think that a lot of the points they're making are not quite as dialectically as effective as, as they need to be. So Lawrence Tribe, and I think it was 1971, I heard this response when I presented to people informally, and then I searched the literature to find, it. well, has anyone actually done, and yes, sort of one of the first papers on the topic took this line. So one response that I came across when I presented this paper to friends was something like, well, it would be outrageous <laughs> to punish because there's a general principle that says, it's inappropriate to punish unless the defendant's guilt is beyond all reasonable doubt. And Lawrence Tribe laid down that uh, kind of argument as an argument against punish. And he said, you know, uh, the acceptance of punish could dangerously undermine the values surrounding the notion that juries should convict only when guilt is beyond real doubt. 
And then he offers some observations that to say that society recognizes the necessity of tolerating the erroneous conviction of some innocent suspects in order to assure the confinement of a vastly larger number of guilty criminals is not to say that society does or should embrace a policy that juries, conscious of the magnitudes of their doubts in a particular case, ought to convict in the face of this acknowledged and quantified uncertainty. So Tribe seems to be uh, suggesting that we don't need, as it were, an infallible basis for, 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 for saying that someone's guilty in order to properly punish them. So we have to allow that a system that on occasion sentences innocent people to prison for crimes they didn't commit nevertheless is a just system. It's just that in accepting a fallible system, we're not also accepting a system that would allow for something like statistical evidence because when the doubts are quantifiable and salient, for some reason, that would preclude us from properly administering punishment. And I think there are two problems with this. So one problem is that when you, when you look at the argument that you get for punish, and you think about the way in which two systems might operate, one system that allows, for example, eyewitness testimony to serve as a sufficient basis for conviction, but doesn't allow statistical evidence. I mean, one thing you should expect in advance is that the one that is using statistical evidence will do a better job screening out the people who are innocent than the one that uses eyewitness testimony. And then you might wonder, well, if there really is a clash between this rule and then the, the use of statistical evidence as a basis of conviction, you know, why shouldn't we then just take this as a reason to revise a rule? Right? I mean, it's a rule that was handed down by our terrible forefathers and mothers. And once we see the implications of living by this rule as opposed to using statistical evidence, you might think, well, this is just a good argument for reform. So there's that response. Um, another response, though, and this response was um, a bit surprising. If you look in the footnotes of Judith Thompson's 1986 paper, she points out that when judges are asked to quantify reasonable doubt, they give a pretty low number. So roughly two-thirds of those asked to put that number below 0.95. So as far as those judges are concerned, it looks like we could have, you know, 10 innocent people running around in the prison yard and you just, you know. I mean, if it looks like, at least as some people understand the phrase, beyond reasonable doubt, there's no tension between using statistical evidence and thinking that you conform to this principle. So if there really is an objection here, right, we need an argument for thinking that there's a right way to think about reasonable doubt and that it's a violation of the principle and also that it's a good principle to defend. Okay. Um, now, there's also this... I have to admit that I I've kind of found this pretty convincing the first time I heard of this. So this is the colvin reagan ferson complaint that a system that allows us to convict on the basis of statistical evidence would appear um, to make it a crime to belong to a reference class. And you're like, oh, that's outrageous. It can't be a crime to belong to a reference class. I mean, it, of course, it's a crime to belong to a reference class if it's a class composed entirely of criminals. But suppose you have one that's sort of a mix you know, criminals and non-criminal baristas or whatever. The idea is that it would be inappropriate to say that someone's membership in that class, uh, where you know that it's not composed entirely of, of criminals, that membership in that class could be sufficient basis uh, for conviction. And so they give this example. Suppose that 99% of, uh, uh, of people from a certain reference class cheat on their taxes. Knowledge of this, they, they think, wouldn't make it justified to uh, charge and sentence them for cheating on their taxes. Uh, we require more evidence than simply their membership in the reference class in question. It's important to note that we require further evidence not, they stress, because we wish to raise the probability above 0.99 or whatever. Rather, we require further evidence because the reference class evidence is not specific to the individual in question. So the idea is that we don't think that the uh, statistical evidence is insufficient because it fails to raise the probability too high. Because as we know from the, the, the lottery literature, you could, of course, make the classes bigger and bigger and bigger, and then people still won't back off. The idea is rather that the statistical evidence is wrong because in some intuitive sense it's not about the defendant. Now, I do think that this idea that it's not a crime to belong to reference class is quite rhetorically effective. I mean, it sort of worked on me. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought I'm not entirely sure what this objection is supposed to be. I mean, the people who defend punish aren't saying that what we should do is redefine crimes so that the crime that was don't cheat in your taxes becomes don't belong to a class of people, most of whom, or 99 out of 100 of, of whom, cheat on their taxes. The crime is still defined as don't cheat on your taxes. The idea is that there's a test, right? A test that imperfectly correlates, of course, with the class of people who have committed the, the crime. But there's a test, and it's a reliable test, uh, and it's a statistical test. Um, so it's not what they're proposing is to redefine the crime, to say that the crime itself is not cheating on taxes but belonging to this group. But then someone might say, but that, you know, practically that has no difference because although you're admitting that the crime remains cheating on your taxes, not belonging to the reference class, you're still saying that belonging to the reference class 
can be a sufficient basis for conviction. So you might say, well, in practice, of course, that's a distinction that doesn't come to anything. But then I started to wonder, but who honestly can then raise these kinds of objections against the use of statistical evidence? So I'm using Martin here as an example. I don't think there's an objection to your view. It's just I was thinking about views that seem to get, tick the boxes we want. So Martin has a view that seems to tick the boxes we want, at least if you're like me, where you want to say that it would be okay to convict people on the basis of, say, um, the use of perceptual experience and testimony, but not okay to convict people on the basis of statistical evidence. And you might say, right, so um, there's, there's a bit of a problem here. So on Martin's view, I could have the justified belief that Martin cheats on his taxes if my evidence provides normic support for that proposition. But it's also part of his view that I could have the justified belief that he cheats on his taxes, I think, if, even if you don't cheat on your taxes. So it just has to be that it's an abnormal situation we're in. The evidence we have is such that, in normal situations, it supports the hypothesis that the person cheats on their taxes only if they actually cheated on their taxes. But if you're in an abnormal situation, you can still have the justified belief that someone who didn't cheat on their taxes did cheat on their taxes. And you can imagine someone saying, but that's outrageous. It's like saying it's a crime to be the kind of person such that someone could justifiably believe of them in accordance with Martin's view that they're a tax cheat. Well, no. I mean, I mean if you think that there could be a fallible basis for just conviction, right, it's really hard to see how you could use sort of the rhetorical strategy of Coley Van uh, Reagan and Ferson. Because you have to admit that you're signing off on the idea that a group of people can sentence another group of people to prison for crimes they didn't commit appropriately. Um, but again, you, you haven't said, well, it's a crime to be believed rationally or justifiably by a jury to have done things. Um, so I, I just, I don't really quite see what um, the, the force of that uh, rhetorical point is that they're making. Um, Finally, there's, there's Judith Thompson's uh, work on this, and I think it comes closest to sort of really putting, uh, she, she comes closest to putting her finger on what the real problem is here, and she, she also is worried about this, this idea of kinds of evidence. So she suggests that the problem with punish is it allows us to punish people without having what she calls individualized evidence, where individualized evidence would be evidence that somehow is causally connected to uh, the criminal and the crime. So the statistical evidence doesn't have the right causal connection to the criminal and the crime, but other things like eyewitness testimony might have the right causal connection. Now, I do think there's something to that, but then when she tries to explain why we need the special evidence, I feel like the rationale for needing the special evidence in some ways falls short. Because it looks like the, the, the justification comes from this passage. Um, our society takes the view that in a criminal case, the loss to society if the defendant suffers the penalty for a crime he didn't commit is greater than the loss to society if the defendant does not suffer the penalty for a crime he did commit. The point might be re-expressed as follows. Our society takes the view that in a criminal case, the society's potential omission loss, or mistake loss is greater than the potential omission loss. It would be no wonder then if our law imposed a very heavy standard of proof on the jury in a criminal case. And according to the friend of individualized evidence, that means the jury must be very sure of having a guarantee before imposing um, liability for a crime. But it's just that last move that I, I, I think is, is, is a bit strange because, of course, the people who defend punish agree with everything in that passage up to the last point. Because what, what Thompson is saying is that it wouldn't be just to punish without what she's calling a guarantee. And she's thinking that high, you know, high probability doesn't provide that guarantee. But of course, it looks like everything up to that point is precisely what people who defend punish say when they're defending punishment. We think it's a terrible thing to sentence the innocent. We think it's only a little bit of a good thing to sentence the guilty. That's reflected by the decision matrix. And because we can attach probabilities to this, we use the rule that says you ought to maximize expected value. And precisely what we're doing is setting those values so as to respect the values that are mentioned in that paragraph. Um, in their work, uh, Enoch and um, Specter and Fisher um, they also suggest there's something wrong with the beliefs that are operative in these kinds of cases. They, they focus on sensitivity. Um, I have some problems with that because I, it's unclear to me why insensitive beliefs can nevertheless be properly entered into uh, evidence in criminal trials, but I'll sort of skip that for, for reasons of time. If people want to come back to that, we can, we can argue about that in the, in the Q&A. But at least when I first started thinking about this issue, I thought, right, the way to crack this puzzle is to do something like what Thompson was doing, is to point out to the epistemic defects of the beliefs that could guide a jury. And then once we see 
why beliefs based on strong statistical evidence are nevertheless epistemically defective. We'll see why the puzzle goes away. And then Enoch et al. Um, take this away from me, and they, they have this, this passage. Uh, why should the law of evidence care about knowledge or epistemology more generally? It should undoubtedly care about truth, accuracy, and the avoidance of error. But why is it important that courts base their findings on knowledge, insisting the law should, after all, accord significant weight to knowledge or to epistemology in general, amounts to a willingness to pay a price in accuracy. So we know that a view, for example, that says that you shouldn't punish on the basis of statist statistical evidence will pay one kind of price because it won't convict in some of the cases the, the other one will. And if you're in favor of conviction, that's a price that you're worried about. And of course, if you signed up to the values in the decision matrix, you do care about conviction. Alternatively, if you think about the way in which eyewitness testimony works and how it's less reliable than statistical evidence, you're also worried about the other penalty you'll pay. Statistical evidence does a better job discriminating out the innocent than eyewitness testimony does. So if you're worried about punishing the innocent, which it looks like you should be given the values in the decision matrix, again, that's another cost to pay. And so Enoch and the others are saying, look, your concerns about the epistemic standing or defects of the juror's beliefs, if what that does is, is forces us to adopt policies that deviate from the policies that vindicate punishment, then that's just going to be a cost that we pay as society and a cost that innocent people pay by being sent to prison for crimes they didn't commit. So it just feels like it's a bit precious to worry about epistemology when there's, you know, lives at stake. All right, nevertheless, of course, that's the direction I want to take things. So I want to suggest that, of course, as everyone in this room probably realizes, there are puzzles in epistemology that are quite similar to the puzzles we face in this, in this practical question. So in this section, I just want to say a little bit about um, believing as opposed to doing. So like Thompson, I think we're going to make headway in this puzzle by thinking about the operative beliefs. So I want you to consider this sort of parallel uh, thesis here, I'm calling it believe, namely that it's sometimes permissible to believe that a defendant is guilty in cases like prisoners where the only evidence of guilt is statistical evidence. So this is not, again, about what to do. This is about what to think. And you might wonder, well, how do we decide this question? Well, it turns out, uh, thanks to some work by Kenny Eastborn, and Kevin Dorst, and some other people, that we can basically just use the exact same reasoning we used to try to justify punish, to try to justify belief. So a lot of the people in this room, I take it, are going to be veritas. They're people who think that there's something good about true belief and something bad about false belief. And maybe they have a kind of conservative attitude. So they think, look, um, you know, better to avoid, uh, better to avoid 10 true beliefs than allow one false belief to get in. Or maybe you have some sort of risk-averse attitude like that. And if that's the case, then we could set up a belief matrix, which looks a lot like decision matrix. It's just about belief now. Where you think, look, if I, if I form the belief that someone is guilty and they're guilty, that's like a plus one. But if I believe they're guilty and they're innocent, that's like a negative 10. And if I don't believe, well, you know, non-beliefs don't realize any value at all, so those just get zeros across the board. And then when we can attach probabilities to this thing, it's just going to turn out that the way to maximize expected epistemic value in cases like this is to believe. And of course, if what you ought to do is maximize expected value, then of course you ought to believe. So as they say, Bob's your uncle. Uh, we've got an argument for belief. The argument for belief looks a lot like the argument for punish. And there's one thing I like to, to point out at this point, and in the long version of the paper, this will probably be more relevant. If you like this kind of decision theoretic argument for believe, we now have another argument on the table for punish. Because to me, it's always seemed a bit weird for us as uh, lovers of normativity to encourage people to believe that they ought to do things and then slap them on the wrist when they act accordingly. So if you think that there's something wrong about being ocratic, and so you want to encourage people to see to it that their attitudes and actions mesh in a certain way, we now have a second argument for punish. Um, I call this the ancillary argument for punish. It looks like we have an argument that you ought to believe that the accused is guilty, so you ought to see to it that if you believe that they're guilty, you punish. So it couldn't be that you should do something other than punish, so you may or should punish. So this recent work in epistemic consequentialism seems like it gives us a parallel argument for belief that looks a lot like the argument for uh, punish. And then you start to think, well, are you ever going to try to derail the argument for punish? And yeah, this is the point at which I do it. So initially, when I first started thinking about these topics, the, the first three objections I mentioned to punish were the ones that I found completely convincing. But then the longer I thought about them, the more I thought, well, they were, they were totally quite effective. But I sort of wonder how, how, how dialectically strong they are, and doubt started to creep in. So let me just mention a few of the things that bother me about the punished position. So one is something that probably won't bother anyone else in this room, 
So I'll just lay this out here because, you know, I'll this is more of a confession. Suppose just as a matter of bad luck, you happen to draw the one person out of the group who happened to be innocent. Just sounds like the kind of thing, but maybe not to you. Now, I'm an objectivist, so I'm one of those people who thinks that what an agent ought to do depends upon what's fitting to the circumstance, not fitting to the agent's attitude towards the circumstance, not what's sensible to do given their perspective. So I'm the kind of person who thinks that there are norms like you shouldn't punish people for crimes they didn't commit. Okay. So, of course, I would think that if I happen to pull the one person out who's innocent, then of course it just follows on my view that I shouldn't have punished that person. And of course, if I shouldn't have punished that person, then either what that goes to show is that the rationality of punishing them failed to establish that it was permissible to do so, or it wasn't rational for me to punish them in the first place. But insofar as I take objectivism to be more important to defend than the premises and the argument for punish, of course, I'm quite happy to sort of do a modus tollens at this point and say, look, if you had bad luck and you pulled the one out of the group who was innocent, we know in advance you shouldn't punish innocent people, uh, done and dusted. Okay, so I don't expect that to convince anyone in the room. I just really like that argument. But there's a second argument that I think is a little bit more convincing. So I've heard a couple people make this point, and it's a point that I think in some ways should um, be something you'd predict if you've thought about the epistemological issues. So when you think about the epistemological issues, right, one of the things that really worry about cases like this in epistemology is it looks like if you start, uh, if you start believing things because of high probability, what you're going to end up doing right, is forming inconsistent sets of beliefs. So the idea is if you think about lottery cases, you'll know in advance right, that one of the tickets is a winner, but you're going to believe of each ticket that it's a loser. So you know in advance you're going to end up with a false belief. And yes, there are views on which, well, you should believe some but not all of the lottery propositions. I think those views tend to be a bit, a bit gimmicky. But then you think, well, okay, so what should we think about the prisoners? If you think we should punish the one we've taken out of the group, when should we stop punishing? I mean, it would be weird if you thought the number was seven, and I think it would be awful if you thought the number was 100. But if you want to make the number 99, 99 and no more, you can't then think that the argument for punish is sound. Because that argument would be sound, of course, when applied with respect to each of the prisoners we've taken out of the yard. So, you know, once you've, once you've signed up for punishing one on the grounds that we've set out, you can't then turn around and say we shouldn't punish 100 people for 99 crimes. And if you think it'd be outrageous to punish 100 people for 99 crimes, as I do, that should worry you about the argument for punish. Finally, there's this, this just occurred to me the other night. Um, I was trying to track down this quote, you know, better, um, so there's the, you know, better that a, uh, well, there's, turns out there's lots of numbers. Blackstone, it was better that 10 guilty people walk free than one innocent person go to prison. Okay, so there's that one. And then there was, um, Voltaire was, I think it was something like two. Um, and then Franklin had, I think it was like a hundred or a thousand. And then Stalin actually had the opposite one, so better, sort of roughly better that a hundred innocent people go to prison than we sort of let one slip through our fingers. And then Dwight Schrute from the American office had a million. Now, these, these values are all over the map, and you start to wonder which are the right values. And I, I mean, I don't know and I don't really care, but suppose your numbers are somewhere closer to, say, Blackstone or Voltaire, right? Where Voltaire's looked like, it was like a sort of two-to-one ratio. I mean, then if you think about that, right, and you think about the, the, the relationship between cases where it'd be acceptable for you to punish, because of maximizing expected value. And the cases where you could rationally believe the person to be guilty, they're just not gonna line up, right? So, I mean, if you think about the decision matrix, if we think something like, well, the first box should be negative one and the second box should be something like negative three or four. Well, then when you think about the probability levels that things would have to be at for you to be, ex you know, for it to be acceptable to punish, there's no way that in those cases it'd be rational for you to believe that the person's guilty. So one thing that really bothers me about the case for punish is that the case for punish would be sound even if we knew in advance that in all of the relevant cases it would be completely irrational to believe that the defendant was guilty. In fact, you could have cases where, you know, if you were a betting person, the rational bet would be bet they're innocent, and yet it would still be acceptable to punish, depending on the values you plug into the matrix. And I think there's got to be something wrong here. It can't be that this argument is sound if, if as it were, it purports to show that it would be permissible to punish in some circumstances when we know in advance it would be irrational for anyone to take the defendant to be guilty. Okay, that was the brief detour into ethics. Um, in terms of time, by the way, Adam, how much time do I have left? You've got about another 30 minutes. Oh, good, okay. Um, okay, so those were my three sort of qualms about the sort of the ethical side of this, about why I think we shouldn't give in too quickly to accept punish. And so now let me talk about the epistemology because that's probably why you're here. Um, so a quick detour into epistemology. So a lot of people think that in some way, 
somehow, uh, what we ought to believe or what's rational to believe is determined by a thinker's evidence at that time. Um, okay, so there's different ways of, of, of understanding this, but I want to consider a kind of a Lockean um, treatment of these issues. So, you know, the Lockean view, at least on some formulations, have two, has two parts. There's the kind of metaphysical side, right, but there's also the normative side. So the metaphysical side, if you're sort of a metaphysical Lockean, your attitude is something like this. We can talk about degrees of confidence or credence, and we can talk about full belief, and the relationship between them is something like a threshold. So to, to fully believe a proposition is to have a degree of confidence that crosses some threshold. There's nothing more to full belief than that. It's like there's nothing more to playing the stereo too loud than turning the dial too far to the right. So, you know, the, 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 the decibel levels, those, you know, we can, we can measure those in numeric terms. And once you've turned it too far towards 10, that's just all there is to the stereo being in the state of, of, of being too loud. And then you could have something similar for belief. But that, then the normative side is something like this. There's nothing more to a rational full belief than uh, having a sufficiently high degree of confidence where that degree of confidence is rational. Now, I think if you're, if you're in that kind of mindset, then you might think that the case for believe is pretty clear. I mean, if I didn't give you enough prisoners in the first case, I can just re-describe the case and give you 1,000 prisoners or 10,000 prisoners. But at some point, right, it looks like we're going to find your threshold. When we take a prisoner out of that population, you'll have to have pretty high confidence that the person we've taken out of the population is guilty. And at some point, that high confidence will just make for belief. And now, if, like me, you agree that your credences should reflect your probabilities, and you can't avoid believing having high credence, then it's just got to be that the belief is rationally acceptable. So I think from a Lockean view, it's, it's pretty obvious how we should, what attitude we should take towards uh, the prisoner's case. I just think it's the wrong one. So to avoid this, um, some people try to pursue a strategy that you might call the defeatist strategy. See, we don't have to sign up. If we, if we like the idea that somehow the rationality of our belief is determined by our evidence, that doesn't commit us to this Lockean picture that what we do is think just about strength of evidence, measure it, and think, right, so anything over some sort of line counts as a rational belief. Because there might also be a way of taking account of the defeaters that are present in our evidence and say, look, even if something gets high probability, it might still be uh, irrational to believe it. So what I'm imagining is a kind of defeatist strategy that says, in cases like prisoners, there might be something salient to the thinker that counts as a defeater that prevents the strong evidential support from constituting a justification. So some people have laid down principles like this, and I'm sort of regarding this as a kind of defeatist strategy. They say, look, if you have a set of beliefs uh, that are logically related in certain ways, and you know that something in that set is false, but you can't identify which one, that would then become a reason to drop the set of beliefs. So the idea might be in a lottery case, yes, there's strong probabilistic support for believing of each ticket that it's a loser, but since you also know that that set contains a winner, and you also know that you can't identify where it is, this consideration, the fact that there is in that set a falsehood that you can't find, becomes a reason now for you to suspend judgment on each of the tickets. But it's not like what it does is tells you to now reassess the probabilities you assign to each ticket, right? So this is a way of trying to um, sort of retain the idea that a thinker's evidence can determine what's rational for her to believe, but at the same time resisting the argument for punish, trying to find a principled reason for saying that high probability doesn't automatically make for rational full belief. It only does so in the absence of defeaters, and this might be a case where there's a kind of defeater present. So that's, I mean, maybe that's a way of understanding some of the moves that people like Sharon Ryan have made in her discussion of the preface and the lottery paradox. Um, I think the defeatist strategy, though, um, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's hopeless, but I think when people play the defeat card, they really need to think through the implications of, of the view they're taking on. Because suppose you're a kind of defeatist, but at the same time, you're also a veritist. So you think that the fundamental epistemic goods are accuracy and inaccuracy, or true belief and false belief. Then it looks like you're going to violate this, the, this, this kind of idea that David Lewis and Sophie Horowitz have defended. So there's a, a passage from Sophie Horowitz. I can't, I, I can't remember if it's on the handout, but I'll, just, I'll read it. A rational agent, she says, um, should be doing well by her own lights in a particular way. Roughly speaking, she should follow the epistemic rule that she rationally takes to be the most truth conducive. It would be irrational, the thought goes, to regard some alternative rule as more truth conducive than your own, but not adoptive. 
To me, that looks exactly like what a defeatist is doing. The defeatist will have to acknowledge that were they to form beliefs ignoring the alleged defeater, were they just to form beliefs as the Lockean would, of course they would do a better job promoting total epistemic value. And yet, for some reason, they're unmoved by that consideration. And you wonder, well, how could they be unmoved by that? If their fundamental values are the pursuit of accurate belief and the avoidance of inaccurate belief, it's really hard to see what justification they have for conforming to a set of principles that require them to take account of defeaters when the, course, when the cost of doing so is the failure to maximize expected epistemic value. Of course, someone could come back and say, well, that's because I have a non-consequentialist attitude towards these things. Or that's because I think that the, the, the value theory that Veritas adopt is the wrong one. And those are perfectly fine responses. But I think some kind of response has to be given so that we don't end up just saying, well, it's some sort of weird brute fact that there happens to be a defeater that only seems to pop up in lottery and preface cases. OK. So I'm not entirely happy with the defeatist position, although I like their attitude towards prisoners. Um, but I think the Lockean view has, has problems of its own. So not only do I think the Lockean view get um, the prisoner's case wrong, I also think it gets a, a case wrong that I'm calling prisoners too. Um, prisoners too is basically a preface version of these kinds of cases. I don't know if these, I don't know if these prefacey versions exist yet in the legal literature, but you know, maybe they should. So um, the way this case works is something like this. Take, take the thing that you think warrants full belief. So if you're the kind of person who thinks that statistical evidence isn't that thing, take something else. So maybe you think it's normic support. Whatever your story is, right, just take that thing. It could be a reliable process, but take that thing. And imagine what's happened is that, um, you know, a hundred people have been convicted because of uh, the work of this one prosecutor. And in each case, right, the jury responded to the evidence that by, uh, by the lights of your theory would make their beliefs justified, right? So we have a case in which there are a hundred justified beliefs about the guilt of people currently in prison. And it looks like what could happen at this stage in the story is that someone who is perfectly reliable comes along and says, in precisely one of those cases, there was a wrongful conviction. Right? So, I mean, again, reliability does not mean infallibility. Normic support allows for a justified false belief. So take any of these views that allow for false justified beliefs. You have a hundred beliefs about the guilt, right? but then someone comes along and testifies that precisely one of those people is innocent, and of course you want to know which one it is, and of course you know what happens next, they die before they tell you. So now you're stuck in this situation where you have, as it were, 101 beliefs, and they'll all be true because of course they're inconsistent. Now in this kind of case, right, my own view, um, uh, and, th and this is a view that I, I share in common with my colleague Julian, you don't now just sort of open the doors and let out 100 prisoners. Um, you, <laughs> sort of every prison warden knows that in those cells is at least one innocent person. But that doesn't by itself justify, as it were, opening all the doors. Um, so I think in some ways one problem with the Lockean view is that it loses, I think, the important distinction between these two prisoners' cases. You shouldn't be putting people in on the basis of statistical evidence. But the discovery that you have one false belief is not, it, as itself, a decisive reason to abandon the entire set. So on the one hand, I think the defeatist takes it too far in one direction, and the Lockean isn't sensitive to a distinction we, we should be sensitive to. So I think we need an alternative to both. And luckily, Aiden's here because Aiden's going to, um, this, this part's for him. This is the part that he will really dislike. Um, so I'll offer you an alternative epistemological theory that will um, leave Aiden completely unmoved. Um, so remember this entire discussion is predicated on some assumptions like that this is a straightforward case of decision under risk and that the matrix that we started with describes the kinds of values um, that the legal system should uh, care about. It should reliably sort people into certain piles and then either punish them or leave them be. Um, it's also constrained by assumptions about the aim of belief and theories of rational belief that are veritist. But we can consider an alternative uh, epistemological framework. So in contrast to a veritist framework that says that the fundam fundamental epistemic goods are accuracy and inaccuracy, um, I'm calling this view Gnosticism which is that the fundamental epistemic goods are knowledge, that's the good, and the fundamental epistemic evil is botched knowledge. So beliefs that fail to constitute knowledge, as it were. And if you adopt that view about the fundamental epistemic goods, then you know, there's no temptation to think that what makes a belief rational is that there's a high probability of truth. Because as we know from the discussions of the lottery, high probability of truth is not itself any good reason to think 
that it's something you could come to know. So whereas Lockeans might see rational belief roughly as the belief that maximizes expected epistemic value characterized in terms of accuracy and inaccuracy, we can offer an alternative account of rational belief, and this comes from the work of Alexander Byrd. So the idea is that knowledge is supposed to be epistemically central in our value theory. Justified belief is a kind of approximation to knowledge. It's an approximation uh, that is independent of one's mental state. So if you attempt to know and you fail for reasons that have nothing to do with your mental states, then the idea is that your belief would nevertheless count as rational. If you do know, your belief counts as rational. But if you form a belief and your failure to know is roughly because no one with your mental profile could ever know that thing, um, then that would count as irrational. So the idea is that the failure to know couldn't be laid on something external to you. The failure to know should be laid at your doorstep because no one who reasoned in the way that you did, given the way things seemed to you, could ever come to know. Now, this view delivers the verdict that we can't rationally believe lottery propositions because we know a priori that such beliefs don't constitute knowledge. It also doesn't deliver any negative verdicts in the preface case, at least it looks like, because in the preface case, if you have a well-researched book and then someone testifies that the book contains an error, everything you've put down in the book, including the preface assertion, is at least a potential case of knowledge. Of course, there's no universe in which they're all knowledge, right? That's true, because the book's inconsistent. But as it were, for each claim in the book, it could be that there's some universe in which that claim is not just true, but known by you. Now, okay. One nice thing about uh, adopting this alternative epistemological framework is we now get to reject the first premise in the argument uh, for believe, and we also get to reject the first premise in the second argument for punish. So at least we're part of the way towards undermining the case for punish. We still have a bit of work left to do. To revisit the first case for punish, remember that that argument didn't depend upon the epistemic status of our beliefs at all. Right? It had all to do with the maximization of expected value, nothing to do with the rationality of belief about guilt. So I now want to revisit the table that we initially drew because I think that when people present this puzzle initially, they, they're, they're not drawing the table right. So the question I want to start with is this. Should the law treat as equivalent from the point of view of the goodness or badness of an outcome, A, knowingly inflicting harm upon someone who happens to deserve it, and B, knowingly inflicting harm upon someone because they deserve it. And I take it those aren't the same thing. Uh, I made a, a snide remark in here uh, towards the end. If you don't agree, just keep reading Kafka's The Trial for a while until that sort of really becomes convincing. I read it last night and I found it totally convincing. The main character is accused of something, no one knows what, is punished for it, and no one knows why. I mean, yeah, he must have done something. But it does feel like when they sort of stick the knife in the heart, they, they've crossed a line. And it's not just because I think we shouldn't stab prisoners in the heart. It's because, in some sense, the attitude shouldn't be, look, I know you've done something, and we don't quite know what it is. We'll never know what it is. But you've got something bad coming to you, and that's what the system's about. I feel like that's perverse. OK, if you, if you have that kind of feeling, then you might think, right, so we have to have a grid that recognizes the difference in value, knowingly inflicting harm upon someone who happens to deserve it, and knowingly inflicting harm upon someone because they deserve it. Now, this is where we can get into some semantic disputes about what punishment is. So I think real punishment involves something like B, and if you have A in the absence of B, that's not real punishment. But nevertheless, what I want to suggest is that this distinction in value is precisely the thing that we should recognize to recognize that a just system of punishment has to have at least some backwards-looking element, something that cares about guilt. Right? Because the idea, well, we'll get into this in a second. So I think that a necessary condition on inflicting harm upon someone because they were guilty of some offense requires knowledge or awareness of the fact that they committed the offense. So at least on my conception of, of um, on my reading of the because, I think you're not in the case of knowingly inflicting a harm upon someone because they deserve it unless you have knowledge that they deserve it. Okay, so that's... I think the because thing entails a knowledge thing. And of course, the absence of knowledge, then if you, if you lack the knowledge, you're in that A case. Maybe you're inflicting a terrible thing upon someone who happens to deserve it, but you can't be doing it because they deserve it, not if you're ignorant of the fact that they deserve it or ignorant of the thing that makes them deserve the punishment. But we don't really need anything quite that strong to get the point across. Something weaker will do. So in prisoners, a member of the jury is, I think, aware that she doesn't know whether the defendant was involved. And so if she supports harming, i.e. inflicting the punishment, her reason for voting cannot be 
that the defendant was involved. So in general, I think an agent's reason for doing something or feeling something or thinking something cannot be the fact that P when they know that they don't know whether P. So for example, I can't say and say the truth. My reason, right, for kicking Martin the shins is that Martin kicked my cat. I don't know if it was Martin who kicked my cat. It's those two things that I think can't be done. I can't simultaneously blame someone for an action while acknowledging that I don't know whether they performed the action. So I think the law shouldn't see any good in knowingly inflicting harm by means of a sentencing when the reason for imposing this harm isn't that the defendant committed a criminal act. So the law can see no good in the cell um, apart from the cell that happens to be harm and known guilt. So in the, re in the refined decision matrix, what I've effectively done is I've broken down the box that was um, punish and guilty into two boxes. So one case where you punish someone guilty is where you punish someone and you know them to be guilty. And another case is where you punish them and you don't know them to be guilty. And one suggestion is the law should see no value in the box where a person punishes someone without knowing them to be guilty. Of course, you could say, no, no, that's not quite right. The law should see no value in a box where we know them, wh sorry, where we know we don't know whether they're guilty. And for the point of this example, that difference doesn't really matter because the juries know they don't know whether the person was involved in cases like prisoners. Now notice that if we re-describe the decision in matrix like this, so now we have these, as it were, these, these three states and two options. Harming when you know them to be guilty, that gets a positive value. But harming when you don't know them to be guilty, that gets a negative value. Harming the innocent gets a negative value. Once we have that in our decision matrix, insofar as, I mean, so one, what that does is it means that harming on the basis of statistical evidence, assuming the statistical evidence doesn't sustain knowledge, that actually wouldn't realize any positive value at all. Now, not only that, we can use that to show that it no longer will maximize expected value to punish in cases where the only evidence is statistical. It fails to maximize expected value. Because what you're doing, right, is engaging in an action that you know in advance could only realize a negative value. Not only that, and this is, I think, mildly interesting, if you plug these values into the grid and you agree that the kind of statistical evidence we've been talking about doesn't support knowledge, and jurors know that it doesn't support knowledge, when we plug in these kinds of values, we can see it was a mistake to think this was a case of decision under risk in the first place. So we were tempted to use the rule that said maximize expected value because we thought of it as a case of decision under risk. And we thought of it in that way initially because, of course, there was uncertainty about whether we were in the case where the person was guilty or the case where a person was innocent. But when we re-describe the decision matrix in the way I've suggested, the uncertainty goes away. We're still uncertain about whether they're guilty or innocent. But we are not uncertain about whether we're ignorant of their guilt. And since we know a priori that we are ignorant of their guilt, we know which box we can't be in. We can't be in any of the boxes that would justify punishment. That's not decision under risk anymore. So, you know, I love decision theory like the rest of you. It just, it simply is the case that the decision theoretic rules that people use to justify punishment simply don't apply if we redescribe the values in the way that I've suggested. Now, some of you, some of you who are, are veritists, and I'm, I'm sure some people are holding out for this view, they might say, look, you could have a, a refined matrix where instead of saying that harming in the case of ignorant guilt is less than zero, that could just be less than one. It could be a positive value, but less good than harming when you know them to be guilty. If you re-describe the boxes in that way, the case for punish could be back on the board. Right? So once you get some positive value into that cell, if it's less than one, if the probability gets high enough, punishment could still be justified. I think that's going to matter when we do the epistemic stuff. Um, my own view is I have no temptation to see a positive value in that cell, but other people might. Okay, Adam, how are we doing on time? Eight minutes. Eight minutes, good. All right, so now back to proper epistemology. I just want to close by saying that I think that this kind of puzzle and, 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 and this kind of case can, can show us some interesting things uh, about epistemology, so I'll just quickly mention a few of them. So I already mentioned the Lockean view, and the metaphysical view, 
that Scott Sturgeon in this passage calls the threshold view. Um, I, think is, I think is an interesting one. So he says, the threshold view yields an obvious and pleasing story about the causal harmony that exists between coarse and fine-grained belief in everyday practice. It prompts the natural thought that, after all, coarse and fine belief generate action in parallel because they are metaphysically determinable and determinate respectively. So one makes for the former. Put another way, the threshold prompts the natural idea that coarse and fine belief march in step as the causal source of action because coarse belief is nothing but sufficient confidence. Okay. So the worry here is something like, if, if you're the kind of person who is skeptical of the Lockean view on the metaphysical side because you think there's somehow a real distinction between full belief and partial belief, you sort of worry, well, if there, are, if there really are two distinct states of mind here, how do they somehow work together to generate action? Do they ever come into conflict? Why does the mind have two systems of representation, of distinct representations, both of which are going to be plugged in to action? And I think these are good questions. But the, the threshold view says that those questions don't arise because full belief is nothing but a matter of sufficiently high degree of confidence. Now, um, One argument against this view, which I find quite interesting, and I think Brian Weatherson has a version of this argument. If you think there's a good argument against belief in the kinds of cases we're dealing with, this is an argument that you shouldn't fully believe the person to be guilty, even though right, there's the, the high probability of guilt. And then you start to wonder, OK, so I, I shouldn't believe the person to be guilty, but should I be highly confident of their guilt? And it looks like the answer is, yeah, of course you should be highly, highly confident in their guilt, right? Because given the high probability of their involvement, you should be highly confident of their guilt. But notice then, it looks like what you're trying to do is to have a high degree of confidence in the absence of belief. Now, if you ought to do that, of course, then you can apply Autumn Plies can, and you think, ah, so what philosophy of mind, sorry, philosophy of law has done is discover that the threshold view is wrong. It's amazing. So you can do philosophy of law and actually discover things about the nature of the human mind. All right. Maybe you shouldn't take that too seriously, but I think it's an interesting argument. Um, there is, related to this, though, something that I think is underappreciated. And I think in some ways, Martin, uh, it might be related to some things that Martin said, so I hope I'm not stealing something from him. But when you think about the Lockean picture, the idea is something like this. And I've seen people defend this explicitly. So Mike Humer, in a forthcoming paper, tries to argue for internalism in roughly this way. He says, look, as the sort of evidence comes in for a proposition, you ought to increase your confidence. But at some point, as the confidence goes up, right, you'll end up being a believer. And he thinks, of course, that's just what you ought to do. You ought to believe the things um, when the evidence tells you you ought to reach some sufficiently high degree of confidence. And the idea here is that when you have full belief and degrees of confidence, the rational pressures they're under will be identical. So anything that is a reason that tells you to increase confidence is going to be a reason that sort of, as it were, should push you towards full belief. And then, of course, if you run that the other direction, any reason you have to not have a full belief should be a reason then to decrease your confidence. And it's that second thing I think is false. Well, the first thing is false too, but the second thing I think is clearly false. So I think what we can have are situations where there are things that are decisive reasons to suspend judgment, i.e. not have full belief, that are in no way reasons to decrease your confidence. In fact, they might have any bearing on what, 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 you know, how confident you ought to be at all. And I think that the prisoner's case is a nice illustration of this. So, for example, you can imagine a dialogue where someone tells you that someone is guilty, and like, how did you know? Now, if they say, well, uh, there was a bunch of eyewitnesses, and they say, oh, actually, it was just statistical, this looks like the kind of case where if you agree that eyewitness testimony can make it rational to believe someone to be guilty, but statistical evidence cannot, you move into a belief state that the person was guilty because you were under the impression that the evidence that supported that was perceptual. But when that's corrected and you learn that it's statistical, your confidence they're guilty should go up, and the belief that they're guilty should disappear. So that looks like a case in which the rational pressures against full belief are not, among other things, rational pressures to decrease confidence. Of course, that would be an impossibility if a certain kind of metaphysical picture is true. So let's just hope that that picture is false. Now, that raises lots of interesting questions, right? If, if you have full belief and degrees of confidence answerable to different rational pressures, then you might start to wonder, well, what, you know, what are the jobs of full belief and partial belief? And I think these are very good questions. Um, so I have a story about what full beliefs are supposed to do. And the idea is that what full beliefs are supposed to do is something that partial beliefs could never do. I unfortunately have no good story about what partial beliefs do, except for sort of push people around to get beer and make bets. But the idea is roughly that a full belief plays a distinctive kind of role in folk psychology, that of providing us with reasons that configure in reasoning. And I don't think partial belief can do that. 
So if you think about the way in which full belief interacts with emotion, I don't think partial belief interacts with emotion in the same way. So the full belief that Martin was kicking the cat can make me angry in a way that a high confidence that it was Martin kicking the cat won't if that high confidence doesn't constitute a full belief. So again, Jonathan Adler had this very nice passage in Beliefs on Ethics where he says something like, you know, mild resentment is not assigning some kind of high probability to the hypothesis that someone did something unspeakable. Mild resentment is believing that someone did something that was a little bit annoying. So mild resentment is the attitude you take towards the roommate who like drank the last of the milk and didn't replace it. It's not the attitude you take towards someone where you think, well, there's like a 0.25 probability that they're Hitler. So the idea here is that it's only with full belief that you're able to enter into a kind of emotional engagement with some state of affairs. And partial belief won't ever do it except in the special case where that partial belief makes for full belief. OK. Um, just very quickly, uh, I'd like somehow to make this talk about Sosa. Because um, so uh, I need to write a paper about Sosa. And, and, and I know it seems like this is a surprise, but it's not. Actually, secretly, this has been, been about him the entire time. So, Sosa is interesting because I discovered, much to my horror, that I agree with almost everything he says, and then he thinks that we can know lottery propositions. And the problem is, is that if it turns out we can know lottery propositions, then all of the annoying little tricks I thought I've come up with to cause trouble for people are pretty much all gone. So I was thinking, right, is there any way to convince people that they don't know lottery propositions? Well, OK, so here's one way to think about it. Um, it's really hard on views that say we can know lottery propositions how you could avoid the case for punishment. Because the following looks pretty good. Um, if you know that someone was guilty, you should punish them. So to me, it looks like if your attitude towards lottery propositions is that you can know that some ticket is a loser, it's really hard to see how you could avoid taking the same kind of position in the prisoner's case. Namely, that if you take a prisoner out of this population at random, then of course, if they're guilty, you could know it. And of course, if they're guilty, and you know it, it's hard then to see how you couldn't punish. So for those of us who do think that it's inappropriate to punish in these kinds of cases, it's very hard to see how you could vindicate the intuition on a view that says you can know lottery propositions. And then there's this other issue, which I think is also problematic. So of course, Sosa doesn't think you can know 100 lottery propositions. But you might wonder, how many can you know? Well, that will, of course, at least if I'm right, correspond to the number of people you can punish in cases like this. And the natural number would be 99. But then you wonder, well, what about the hundredth person? See, I, I'm an objectivist, so I actually have the crazy view that you should punish precisely 99 people in cases like this. Well, uh, in, in other cases, but not, not. Anyway, everyone thinks that's ridiculous. But then you wonder, well, OK, but Sosa has two options, right? If he thinks that adroit belief, which falls short of knowledge, could be sufficient for justifying punishment, then it looks like you'd have adroit belief in all 100 cases if you have apt belief in 99. And of course, if you have adroit belief in 100 cases and adroit belief is sufficient for justified punishment, then it looks like someone with Sosa's views would be committed to saying we ought to punish 100. Again, if you think that's morally outrageous, that's, again, a further reason to worry about the epistemic credentials of the beliefs that would purport to justify this punishment. And then I started thinking there's another thing that I find um, puzzling about this. I know many people here work on the value of knowledge um, and the value of true belief and things like that. So remember, I said, look. Um, if you assign positive value to knowledge and true belief, but then you say true belief is somehow less valuable than knowledge, that's like saying I'm going to assign positive value to punishing people when they're guilty, but maybe a little bit less value when we don't know if they're guilty or something like that. Well, notice then that once you adopt that kind of evaluative framework, a lot of the decision theoretic arguments are back on the table. Right? So as soon as there's some positive value that a true belief that isn't knowledge could realize, then the high probability of a belief being like that could constitute a reason to take it on board. And then, of course, you get back to this problem that you know, maybe in principle, beliefs that you know you can't know, if they have sufficiently high probability, could be rationally believed, even when you know you can't know them. And that's a, that's a kind of beast that I think our epistemological theories uh, should avoid. But then I was thinking also, you know, why Sosa thinks knowledge is valuable. And this is something I think is interesting. So a lot of people in this room, I think, think knowledge is valuable. And a lot of, a lot of them think knowledge is better than true belief somehow. And maybe a lot of them also think true belief is valuable. But then you wonder, well, you know, what does the difference consist in? Now, I get the sense that many people like the kind of Sosa picture, which is when you think about what's involved in the acquisition of knowledge, and then you compare that to the acquisition of beliefs that happen to be true but aren't knowledge, right, that's where we're going to see the sort of the ground for the difference in value. It's in the story of the acquisition. 
But what's missing from that story is what's good about getting into the state of being a knower sort of in the first place. So one thing you might think is, no, the story about what makes knowledge valuable is that there's got to be something that you get as a consequence of coming to know, not just something that you put into the process of coming to know. And I think if you don't do that, then it's going to be very hard to meet the Enoch challenge. It's going to be very hard to explain why the law should care about knowledge because it looks a lot like the value of knowledge just comes around from the fact that it was a very nice performance. If, however, you're thinking, no, there's something about being in the knowledge relation that differs, importantly, from being in the true belief relation, then the idea might be that, no, actually, by virtue of being in the knowing relation to some fact, right, then you acquire something of value. So it's subsequent, as it were, to coming to know that something valuable occurs, not the process of acquiring the knowledge where the value can be found. Now, what could that thing be? Well, I've kind of hinted at it, right? So some people like John Hyman think that what's distinctive of knowledge and what distinguishes it from other states of mind is that by being in the knowing relation, you can treat certain kinds of things as reasons for action that you couldn't have treated as reasons for action had you not known. To me, that's a much better story about what's going on in the prisoner's type case. It's only when you know the person's guilt that the person's guilt could have been your reason for sentencing. And I, of course, think that the law should care about whether juries and their reasons for sentencing had to be the guilt of the person. So that, to me, seems like the kind of thing that should matter to the law. That story about the value of knowledge, and I could see why that would matter in a legal context. But the stories about the value of knowledge that make the value of knowledge turn entirely upon the excellence of the performance and the acquisition of it, it's a bit more obscure about why anyone but epistemologists would care about that. Okay, am I out of time yet? No, I mean, I'm, I'm completely out of ideas, so just, <laughs> just done. Thanks. <laughs>